seconds because sometimes it's just, it's just not. All right, go. Green Flim Tacos. On the lunchroom wall hangs a poster that grows a pair of lips and spits in my face. Its words become green phlegm dripping down my eyebrows and cheeks and landing on my food as I eat. Its words say, we would like to thank our production staff with a taco lunch for working determinedly for many consecutive days. So join us and keep up the good work. These words create a hatred so deep that my existence becomes a rope hanging on the trembles of my jaw. I guess with these tacos, my family will get back to hours. Daddy wasn't home. I guess my son's feelings of neglect will disappear with just a splash of red salsa and onions. Maybe his homework will get undone and time will retract and I will come home to be a good father. Or maybe with these tacos, I am to be grateful to a company who makes millions a week and gives us lunch instead of a raise. Maybe I'm just supposed to accept this lunch with all its strings attached to my arms and my legs. Maybe I'm disrupting the rhythm of economic order. Maybe I'm just supposed to stay quiet, benevolent, and not think of capital while living in a world that requires it to stay alive. The taco truck arrives. Everyone begins to freely talk and laugh. Everything remains the same. No one seems to feel the spit on their foreheads. No one can feel the gravel under our feet turn into repeated cycles of lies. Should I join this laughter? Should I forget that I'm a man that lives on more than just diversions made of double tortillas to fill me up so I can hurry up and get back to work? Should I let these tacos stop me from questioning how much I get paid and compare it to the profits being made? Somehow these tacos seem like a joke where the only one who isn't laughing is me. What's up, bro? That's it. What you got against Taco Tuesdays, man? Hey, bro, I love tacos, but I hey, but I like a raise a lot better, brother. <laughs> you can buy your own tacos, right? I buy my own fucking tacos. Oh, yeah, you are correct. Bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just, that just Taco Bell bullshit you giving us. <laughs> nah, dude, nah, dude. Or King yeah. Taco, bro. Nah, homie. <laughs> oh, man. It's so good to be joined by you right now, Caesar. Um, So uh, for this next hour, for the next uh, 45, we're being joined right now by uh, by uh, by Caesar Avalar, who is an incredible poet um, uh, from, you know, come kind of all, all the uh, L.A. area kind of, you know, yeah, uh, dude. He's home I've several been everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So me and you first met at Tia Chuchas. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your experience with Tia? First of all, tell us what Tia Chuchas is because, you know, it's a wide variety of people watching this. So tell, tell us a little about what Tia Chuchas Cultural Center. Tell, tell us what that look, is. look, dude, to be like on the deepest level first, Tia Chuchas is a house of energy, homie. And But for the mainstream people out there, it's a, it's a cultural center. Um, it's a community space. So take your kids and get them, you know, educated, community style. You know, that's what the Achuchas is. And um, and it's also a place for healing. It's a it, man, I don't even know how to explain it. But if I had to explain it for the mainstream people that watch this, it's probably, you know, a community center where you can get a whole bunch of community classes. But for us, for community, it's a special sacred place. Yeah. So, uh, so okay. So, for for for, uh, for those who um, for the mainstream, for the squares or whatever, <laughs> squares, <laughs> a, brother. Basic, a basic history of Tia Chuchas. Like, who runs Tia Chuchas? Where, where, from where does Tia Chuchas emerge? Um, you know, it emerges from it emerges from from Luis J. Rodriguez and Trini Rodriguez, right? And emerges from from uh, from Luis J. Rodriguez's aunt. That was a super creative spirit. If you read the book Always Running by Luis J. Rodriguez, you'll see that his Tia Chuchas was, was always out there, you know, playing the guitar, talking about lovers' experiences, just a, a free spirit that, you know, in, in, in our Raza conservative world, um, and we could even talk more about that, like free spirits are not accepted, you know, and Tia Chuchas was that free spirit that wrote yeah. poetry and music and all of that, you know? So, so how is your free spirit managed in the factory system? Oh, you know, damn, that's crazy because my free spirit in the factory, see, I'm known in the factory as a dude that doesn't care. You know yeah. what I mean? Because I'm so free. 
but I I have to write in the factory. Like I have to I have to have my little book of poem, my little my little my little book that I carry. I have to write about it. You know, it, there's way too much education in the factory not to write about it. You know, like I feel that uh, that my creativity comes from that burning. That I need education. I need intellect. I need to. I I I I need it. I feel it. And since I'm all around it, social issues are all around in the factory. That that's when my creative spirit comes out. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about your little little book you carry around. A uh, little book I carry around. Hold up. Let me show you real quick. Oh, damn. This little book that I carry around, they're like this size. And I need them this small size. Because as a slave in the factory, you don't have that freedom to be like, oh, I'm going to write a poem and it's accepted. Right there, anything that doesn't have to do with making money or for you to be a slave during those hours doesn't make sense. Like there's like creativity, something that's not celebrated right there. So yeah. you, you, you run to the bathroom? I mean, how do you, how, you bust it right oh, out? Oh, yeah. Well, well, sometimes there's poems that happen in the bathroom. But since I'm on my machine and sometimes I got to take notes on my machine and what it's doing, I'm pretending to be writing notes about what's going on. But they're poems, bro. They're poems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're freedom poems. Like, right, you know right, what right. I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. That, that's what I write. Dude. Yeah, yeah. And, and, no, and no snitching applies. Uh, right now, Fuck so. no, bro. Oh, no snitching the <laughs> well, well, actually, actually, we are live. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm not gonna lie, dude. Like, hey, I write about like, like my boss, I write about motherfucking sellout workers, I write about so there is snitching, but just no names, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not saying you know, I'm telling, I'm telling all our audience right here. I'm oh, the, no, the oh, no, snitch, yeah, no snitching, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you're gonna line. get a poet fired, dude. I'll be starving that <laughs> poet then. Okay. All right, share another poem. Share another poem. Let's do, let's, let's let's keep. Yeah. All right. Let me give you another poem. Yeah. All right. It's called the it's called the yogurt machine. Um, it's the voice, it's the music that turns walls into the feet of dreams. Every turn is a realization, an artificial dance with nature, a barbiturate made of metal and yogurt, of dairy, a drop of cinnamon color rain. With every stop and go, with every ticking sound into the clicks of its drums, fingers of factory parts flow like poetry, being born from the depths of the soul. The warmth of the morning's kiss is still fresh inside me. It visits me with an I love you from my lady and a te quiero mucho papi from my son. These words run through this machine as if laughter and imagination are having a meeting in my brain. This machine turns words and hard work into a song that lasts forever. Hieroglyphics of American factory blues, Central American blisters that turn into seeds that bloom into lifetimes. Somehow, somehow, there's a beauty in captivity, a tranquility in modern slavery, a sound that helps the mind realign with nature, a voice within the rust of shackles and a dance through the lifelong battles of blue collar circumstances that scream in every turn and every sway of an old overworked talking machine. Damn. Yeah. Hey fool, call yeah. me weird, but I have an intimate connection with my machine, bro, for real. <laughs> I, I talk to that machine more than I wanna talk to some of my coworkers, for real. Yeah. Is it like a love hate or, or are you just like are you just like love your machine, hate your coworkers? Nah, dude, it is it well, you know what? It's a hate hate. Fool, I hate both of them. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> nah, nah. So in the poem you mentioned uh uh Central American, I mean I know that uh being Salvadoran is a big part of uh big part of your work, you know, big part of your life, big part of uh you know the way you just move through the world. Can you talk a little bit about like uh, how that has influenced you as a as a writer? Yeah, you know what, being being Central American, my mom's from Honduras, right? Oh. My dad's from El Salvador. And um and dude, being Central American is kind of dope because it's dope because you get to see things through that filter. You know what I mean? Like you get to see like like you know working in a predominantly Mexican environment, you get to see, bro, you get to see like how other folks will talk to you 
and then they won't talk to Mexicans because they know that you have a problem with them and they think they think that you're in that same mindset that you're going to play that game see I have to deal with that environment so being Central American is dope bro like I get to see that kind of shit all the time yeah does that make sense well, I, expand on it. Tell me what. what, what I, well, first of all, first of all, I know that there's a lot of problems between the Mexican and Central American community. I know the Mexican community is a lot larger, so sometimes it, it, it really kind of onus falls upon oh. the Mexican. You know, you know that's that, that's it's a it's it's it kind of like look I'll, like I'll give you an example. Like I'll expand on an example. Yeah, like a super. Said, uh, like a, I'll give you like an exa- I'll give you an example of yeah. like a raw and uncut uncomfortable yeah. shit that goes on. Right. Like let's say like there's a there's a white dude, right? Mm-hmm you know, that knows about Los Angeles culture, lives here, and he tells me, damn, those guys just don't understand over there. All right. Knowing that I'm Central American, knowing that there's problems, what do you mean by those guys? Like, do I, am I not brown also? You know what I mean? Like, am I not, like, you know? Like, what do I have to, you know, he's not telling me, I know both of your nationalities don't get along, so I'm confiding in you the dumb shit that I say. He's not saying that, but he's saying it, but he's saying it without saying it. You yeah. know, relying that I'm going to be some lame, colonial-minded dummy or nationalist dummy that's yeah. going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, let me buddy up with you real quick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like that, that's the interesting part. Yeah. No, I, I think that we need to we need to heal the divisions between our communities. But, I think that yeah. as, as Mexicans, the Mexicans being the larger group, the, the, the kind of onus or the majority of the worst got fallen on us. I mean, not to say that it doesn't go both ways, but like you know, Mexicans are the larger group. It is like the dominant, whatever. But yeah, we, of course, we got we got we got to come together, and, and a lot of that work's got to be done in both communities, but really the Mexican community. But I, as as someone as a Mexican, I am curious as to what these people are telling you about us. I mean, now, now I gotta know. Now, like now I gotta. Oh, you see, yeah. well, well, you see, they don't really hey, see. That's the thing, dude. That's the thing about like uh, that's the thing about like like whitewashed mentalities bro like they all put you in a category right but then when they want to be picky on who they want to mess with then now you're different you know what i mean like yeah that that's basically like how it is you know what i mean like being central american kind of reminds you that you're always in this competition for space like for example like us right you talk about putting things behind and you talk about uh you know the, the problems that we're having as a community. Dude, in, in, in Rudy Acuna's book, Occupied, Occupied America, there's a section in there that says competition for space. Bro, that's what it is. It's a competition for space, a space that doesn't belong to you, a space that ain't yours, but you got to make money in that space. So if you go like looking at it through that lens, there is like, oh, there is no, you did this to me, I did this to you. This is a competition of space because of capitalism, my friend. Like, that's it. If you can put everything else through those filters, there's no, oh, you did this to me, I did this to you. It's more like, hey, we're f- doing this to each other, you know what I mean? But you got to understand that first. Like, you know, that that has to be there first. Yeah, that's the seed, and then, and then the tree that's grows the, out. Yeah, that's the seed. After that, you yeah. could just be like, oh, okay, I get it, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Oh, let's hear another poem, man. Let's keep, let's keep, let's keep this going. All right, let's hear another poem. I don't know if you get three, but, like, you know, I, I got you here now. So, like, let's just... All right, you got me here, bro. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, this is an old school one, bro. This is about my kid. La Paleta. So this is it. This is what my future's all about. An eternity of being poor. A lifetime of being in prison by my own lack of financial means. Even an ugly day is beautiful when you have money. Children from the neighborhood run to their parents when the paletero man yells, paletas, paletas, but not my son, at least not today. Today we had to watch Sesame Street with the volume up at full blast just so we wouldn't have to hear the enticing yells of raspados, elotes, paletas. His cries shake the inner fibers of my soul. His sadness cuts deep and beyond the scar tissue of my identity. So now what? Now what, Uncle Sam? You got me cornered, but my heart just won't let me call it quits. You take away jobs, I find ways to get money. You raise tuition, and I find ways to obtain an education. My back is wet because you soaked it in stigma. You keep punching, and I keep coming forward. You give me your best shot and still can't put me down. Without any money, all I can do is think, read, 
and dream. And I've come to the conclusion that you owe us a future and my son an ice cream. Yeah. Oh, that that's great. great. That's great. Uh, so, um, man, um, so much, so much in there. So much in there. You mentioned fighting, but I know, I know you're a big fight fan. So, uh, oh yeah, oh so yeah, who, bro. So, who you got? There's, a, there's a fight coming up, uh, or what? When the world comes back together, there's a fight between uh, Lomachenko, Vasily Lomachenko, the great Ukrainian boxer, great, probably the greatest Olympian ever. Uh, yeah, and he's going to be fighting against your fellow Honduran, uh, Teofimo Lopez. Who you got? Uh, you know what, dude? I got, I got, I got Lomachenko, bro. Damn, that sucks. But I got Lomachenko. Only, I mean, I think Teofimo can hurt him, no doubt about it, you know? Because yeah. he's, 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 but I think to land a straight right hand on Lomachenko, yeah. it, dude, it, it is that, I don't think he can do that yet. And I don't I think, think he has that Philly shell style on like, on point the way he should against the Lomachenko. It's too soon. They're, they're it's, too soon. it's too soon, bro. You, you're biting off a little bit more than you could chew. I mean, hey, hopefully you do your thing, but I think Lomachenko's got him, dude. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Mikey Garcia, that's a different story. I think Mikey Garcia knocks out Lomachenko. Yeah, but it's not too soon for Mikey. I mean, Mikey's got nah, experience no. professional as well. All right, so uh, uh, getting back to Tia Chucha. So, so Luis Rodriguez is the founder. You're there at Tia Chucha. It's the first time we meet. You're there with the camera crew. Yeah. What's up with that? Dude, the first day that I met you was dope, bro, because we were there. We had there was a, a writing workshop that Tia Chuchas was putting out. And uh and it was it was in in in, in they were work partnering up with uh the Ford Theater. I remember that. And um damn dude, I can't remember damn what's the name of the homie that did the workshop? Steve something. Steve Connell. Yeah, Steve Connell, bro. Hey, that's a beautiful soul right there. And I remember, dude, he was like, you know what? You're the feature today. We'll just put you on. I remember he did that, dude. And then so he made a DVD about all of that. But whatever. That was how I met you that day. And it was crazy because they had double featured. So they featured everyone that was in the workshop. But then Matt Zedillo was right there. And that's the old school Matt Zedillo, homie. Not the Matt Zedillo that I'm talking to right now. That was the old school one. You know, I'm fucking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm lit. I fucking hate capitalism, and I'm going to just run it. Like, you know what I mean? Like the younger Matt, homie. I, rem I remember, bro. And I remember that was the first time I heard your work, like, live. I had seen it on YouTube, but I hadn't I hadn't heard it, like, you know, in the intimate space as Tia Chucha. And that shit was bad, you know? That was a really dope night. That was the night I met you, man. Yeah, I was really impressed. But I was really impressed by I mean, you really stood out, but then I was uh... – we ran into each other again at uh, turning the tide. Uh, oh yeah, in Pomona. Oh no, 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 not in Pomona, in LA. Yeah, turning the tide. I remember that. Razor, yeah. Damn, I yeah. didn't remember that shit was hard. That shit was hard. Yeah, and you. Did that was poem. another dope place. That was another dope place. Yeah, and you did a poem that night about and had like uh, the Chavez uh, Taylor fight in it. You you made you made mention of it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that's such an epic. When I, because fighting spirit, bro, that's that that's like an epic fight for five fans to watch because, you know, you, he lost the fight, bro. You know what I mean? But but but, hey, he won it at the last last second, bro, of not giving up. And that you know that that, that's a worker, that's a parent, that's a poet, that's you know everybody struggling, bro. And I yeah. felt that. Yeah. yeah. So let's hear another poem. Who? Let me see. From the sound of boots scraping the dust of stolen dreams, the earth lovingly opens its ear. Roots become intestines of change. Anger gets swallowed by the yell of raging fluorescent lights. History's bloodlines turn into words of languages that still haven't even been spoken, that are just whispers of rain tapping on pavement vibrating on sacred souls of chump change workers moving towards the light of the universe dancing in the movement of blindness becoming alive here in this captive cave of time clocks and lost civilizations the roof disappears stars become lost cousins black holes the hunger of swallowed memories time gets recycled and disappears when the energy has fulfilled its purpose 
When boots scrape against the dust of stolen dreams, nothing is what it seems. Insanity is the food for humanity. The production of products is what keeps this world moving. Systems of nothingness become doctrines of lies. Appetites for poverty become the sound of rumbling factories. We become mazes in which we are all the hidden exits. Camouflage inside this stone wall of life. From this dust of stolen dreams, distractions become the music of lethargic slaves, clapping a rhythm that keeps us moving. Coffee becomes crack, eyes become windows the size of crying globes, while the world around us is sleeping, waiting for our sun to set so they can rise and go to work and take part in the cycle of scrapping boots on the dust of stolen dreams. That's it. Damn. Yep. Yeah. So we're moving we're moving past the T Teacher's Days. Uh you relocate to Pomona and you're in Pomona yeah. and and then uh one day you're walking by uh Cafe Con Libros and they have like you know signs in the window and what happens next? Dude, they got signs on the window, right? And because I take walk I used to take walks right there. So they got signs on the window and there is no brown space here that I see like, oh wow, that's a brown space, you know? So then I look and I see this thing that says Café con Libros Press. And then it doesn't say open. It doesn't say nothing. It just, you know, it looks like it's under construction. But I go in, bro, and I was like, oh, you know, what, what, what is this? And then they're like, oh, this is a store. They don't even know what to call themselves yet. Oh, we're Café con Libros. And, and you know, uh, we promote literacy. The Bati, you know, the founder, she was so humble. She didn't even know how to express what they really were, right? But I, I knew what she was trying to say. I could tell by the space, the community library that they have right there and that they were setting up. I knew that this was a spot where where I should help out in some kind of way. So then I was like, are you guys going to do poetry? And then they're like, well, we were thinking about it, but this spot runs off of volunteers. I was like, well, I could volunteer with that. They go, well, like what? I go, I could do, I could host an open mic. That's what I could help with, you know? So then they were like, oh, that's great. We know we would love that. So then that's what happened. I ended up hosting um, Obsidian Tongues open mic at Café Con Libros. And how long have you been doing that? Um, One, two, it's going to be, it's going to be three years, bro. That's, that's but see yeah. the in the the interesting the interesting part of Café con Libros is that that place doesn't give up either because 15 years ago that space was open, you know, but they had to close, and it was the only you know uh, revolutionary bookstore that sold books like you know that that are aimed you know for change and struggle and all of that. So yeah, they sell my book. Yeah, and they sell your book. So you know, homie, that ain't no bougie bookstore. <laughs> Let's hear another poem, man. Let's hear another poem. All right. All right. Hold on, man. Oh. All right. Talking about boxing, this is about shadow boxing in a in a in a in a trailer. So I do. In his shadow, there are five hundred years of repetitive behavior: work, fight, die, and become reborn. In this body, there are tired knuckles, bruised arms and legs, throbbing toes, deteriorating flesh. Only the fire in his heart can release the weakness through his pores. Only the ritual of body versus shadow can release the light that feeds his mind. The shadow is ready, the dance begins, and nature smiles while the alignment takes place. Only through moving with the rhythm of time can he have a chance. The shadow is wise, strong, and light moves like a candle soaring through the air, jumping on a wall, reflecting the light that comes from flame. But his body is tough. It feels the pains of survival. It moves with the intuition of heartbeats. It shines like ripples on street puddles. He is the rain and sun. He is flesh, nature becoming one. The body and shadow are moving like hawks in a canyon. Their punches stump in the echoes of wind. Their feet begin to slide in and out of reality and into landscapes of creation and dance. The dance gets hotter. The moon becomes smoke 
and the energy of shadow and body bring back the focus in a man that's hungry and tired. It's hard to tell who's winning. It's impossible to see. The only one who knows is the speed of clarity and the dying voice of insanity. The shadow slows down. So does he. He looks in the mirror and must be honest completely. Some days he wins, some days he loses, but the shadow and body must always dance, always burn, and always fight to stay alive. That's it. Yeah. So that's me trying to get some exercise in the trailer, bro, after eating all those tacos. <laughs> so so uh, you described this thing where they don't want to give you a raise, but they want to they give you tacos. Do you think that's kind of like a kind of a, a microcosm or kind of just like kind of the way like the it's like a metaphor for the for the general uh our general moment do you know what i think that is bro i think that is the way we stay stupid bro like no lie like i don't even like to be like rude like that but that's just the way it is bro like tacos taste good that's for sure a lot of things taste good but you got to put your pleasure aside man the way these folks do and you know uh you know that that's just the way capitalism is you know what I mean? Even socialism, bro, and the so-called socialism, it's just another way to redistribute capitalism, homie. You could put whatever name you want on it, but injustice is injustice. That's it. Yeah. That's how I feel, bro. You know what I mean? You can, can name it whatever you want, bro, but a poor man is a poor man, and a rich dude is a rich dude. That's it. Yeah. Poor man's a poor man, rich dude's a rich dude. That's so, it. That's so it. How, how, how should this poor, how should rich man, poor man resolve their conflict? You know what, bro? It sounds sad. It sounds sad. But the poor just got to come together, bro. That's the only way. And there is no resolving conflict. It's It's coming to an agreement that until we live like this, there will always be conflict. You know what I mean? That That's just it. As a matter of fact, I could get in trouble for even telling you how I think the conflict could be resolved, bro. Because everybody always wants to say it's through peaceful means. But, bro, there's nothing peaceful about keeping people oppressed. That's very archaic. That's very primitive, bro. And we're not primitive, homie. Brown folks, we ain't primitive. We're innovative thinkers. But these dudes, homie, that own everything, these fools are primitive. I got it and you don't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> Hey, so so yeah. So in addition to being yeah, before we get ourselves in trouble here, uh, in addition to being a, a poet, you're also also so what uh what what has it been like hosting your own open mic? How how, how do you relieving, bro? It's been awesome because it's different because I never ever did that kind of thing right there. I've never done like hosting, but I just felt like I wanted to for this space. And how it is, it's real, it's humbling, dude, because you get to hear other people's, like, you know, heartbeats. They're, they're thinking what, what makes them go. And, and you've been to Obsidian Tongues. There's all kind of walks of life right there. And I like it. Nobody gets shunned away. You have a comment you want to say, you go ahead and say it, negative, positive. I know they don't like it that much because I'm a little too open. But, A, a community is based off a of difference. And I learned that from Tia Chuchas. I learned that everybody matters no matter what. You know what I mean? No matter what, everybody matters. Even people in opposition of you, you have to hear it. It has to be heard in order for it to sink into other folks. Yeah. So it's been a it's been a learning experience, a humbling experience, and and man, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad you did too. Um, yeah. yeah, but let's get some more poetry, man. Cool. Let me hear. Let me see. R. It's called El Prisionero. Uh, shout out to all the janitors in the world, man. My dad was a janitor. So every time I see somebody cleaning, I have a soft spot. And there's a really nice man in, the, in, in where I work. And he's a janitor. And this song is called El Prisionero. This, this poem is called El Prisionero. In the restroom, he is always singing. He is a janitor, the cleaner of hallways and toilets, the cleanser of soul and healer of minds. He sings boleros, corridos, and classical rancheras. 
His voice is a bird of sacred plains, soaring through the valleys of a broken people, crying in the highest peaks of our starving imaginations. He sings a song called El Prisionero, a song so powerful, a voice so timeless, its sound of medicine, of sacred herbs floating through the air and healing the wounds of a people's confined emotions. I know this song. We are all this prisoner, this filth of reality, this open note that spins love and labor into a song. He is more than just a janitor. He is a healer, a sacred voice that has brought life back to a people who have forgotten who they are, and most of all, forgotten how to sing. Mm-hmm. All right, brothers. I'm uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you for uh, I'm gonna ask you a question that I've been posing to a lot of people. Right? Okay. Why is it that a market system cannot uh, provide uh, the life saving you know technology necessary in this moment of pandemic? Because it's not. Because it's not. It's not. How do I want to say it? It's. Because it's not economically worth it to them, you know what I mean. I was, I was, I've been doing a little bit of a, a research upon this, and and it makes no sense to be the first person to make a vaccine. You know, they want to get, they want to, they they want to rape the recipe of a vaccine and make millions of dollars. You know, after everything is done, you know what I'm saying? It's like a white T-shirt. You know, let. Let's make a white t-shirt company make white t-shirts and then uh, we'll get the recipe and make it our own. You know what I mean? Like the world's about knockoffs. The world's China on steroids, homie. Knockoff is it. That's it. So like that's why I think it. I think it's greed. And I think it's a lot of things, you know, like I don't like to jump into the conspiracies, but also like what is a conspiracy? You know what I mean? The, when we talk about these things, people say, oh, it's a conspiracy. But, hey, man, when a corporation does it, they call it business planning. So, you know what I mean? Like, I think think that it's a whole bunch of things why, why, why you know, markets can't save us. I think because it's not in their best interest to save us. I think it's in their best interest to to capitalize on our deaths and our sicknesses and all of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that well put. So, um, any like final words? If what, what, what people want you to know about you, what you got coming up, what's what's on the horizon? Uh, you know, uh, every second Saturday, if you go on a uh, Cesar Kirk Avelar, a uh, Cesar K Avelar on Instagram, there's gonna be an open mic, City and Tongues open mic, and um, check out Cafe Con Libros in Pomona, um. And, you know, I'm on the right. I'm on the move. I'm trying to I'm trying to publish, put I put together a manuscript and, um, you know, I'm really just I'm really if I need anyone to know anything about me, it's just that I want the best out of you just the way I want the best out of me in La Cash. I believe in that. Those are my morals. You are the other me and I am the other you. And uh, if you see me, just holler, say what's up. All right, Cesar. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you for Hey, appreciate you too, brother. All right. Peace. We'll, peace. we'll see you soon. All right.